recording perfect. All right, move everything around here. So again, as with before, if you are, uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, go ahead and ask them in the chat box. I will pause for questions at different points, but if you have questions that come up uh, throughout, feel free to just go ahead and type them in there. Uh, I hope everybody had a good spring break, even though it was much different than I'm sure you all envisioned. I hope you're able to at least, uh, you know, kind of catch your breath and settle your mind and take a little bit of time off. Um, you know, good news is the end of this craziness is in sight when you look at the data, when you look at the models and you look at the projections. Um, you know, we are definitely not out of the woods. We can't become complacent anytime soon, um, but there is an end in sight. So things will return to normal eventually, even if we have to continue doing this goofy, uh, you know, me talking at my computer and you all listening to me, even though I can't see you or get any indication that you're listening. So. Not last week, but uh, two weeks ago, you all took your exam. Um, I don't remember how much of a curve there was. I think there was maybe a two question curve. Um, and you can see the actual breakdown of performance here. Average score, um, good, 81%, uh, a little bit higher than normal. Uh, high score was a perfect 100. And then your standard deviation is reasonably tightly clustered. You can see really good performance, um, you know, a lot of Bs and a lot of As on the actual exam itself. I'm going to pause real quick. If you have any questions about the exam or uh, anything else, please feel free to go ahead and just type that in that chat box um, really quickly, and I will do my best to answer them. <clears throat> Can I ask what's the final going to look like or do we have one for this class? You do have a final for this class and while you get to drop one exam, you do not get to drop the final. So everybody needs to take the final exam. Please, 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 everybody remember, take the final exam. Um, I am not going to let somebody make it up because they thought that they didn't have to take it because they could drop it. So everybody has to take the final exam. Um, the final will look very similar to the format of the previous exams. Um, there will be some new material, these four lectures we're covering before the final exam, and then it will all be, the rest of it will all be um, on the material throughout the class. Um, it will almost all be um, multiple choice, or maybe some true or false, and there may be a couple short response, but most likely it's going to be multiple choice. Um, it will, I think we have allotted something like two and a half hours. I'm not going to write an exam that's going to take you all two and a half hours. Um, so um, we're still going to administer it during that time period we have set aside, um, but I, I don't know how many questions it'll be. Um, it will definitely be more than the other exams that you have taken so far. Um, Ruthie asks, is the final exam going to be on lockdown browser or same as exam three? It'll be same as exam three, and it will be open book and open note. Um, again, that does not mean uh, it's a collaborative activity. It's only by yourself. Um, and I'm writing all these questions, so there's no point in Googling them because they're not going to be on Google. Um, but uh, yeah, it will be open book and open note. I'm going to pause last little bit if there are any final questions.
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and push on, but if anybody has any questions about the exam or anything else, again, just pop them in that Zoom group chat. All right, so today we're talking about psychological disorders. The next two classes are gonna be about psychological disorders. Um, today is gonna to be kind of setting the framework for what is a psychological disorder. At the end, I'm gonna show you a series of videos that highlight uh, some psychological disorders what I think really well, and we'll talk about those uh, after I show each of those videos. Um, and then next time we're gonna actually talk about kind of the different clusters of disorders. So next time we'll be more specifically on the types of disorders that are out there. But first, we are talking, or excuse me, our fun fact of the day, cheerophobia is the fear of fun. One of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody says, I like having fun. Of course you like having fun. Almost everybody likes having fun. It's pretty much definitional that you would like having fun. So there you go. Hopefully none of y'all have cherophobia. So what is a psychological disorder? Um, when we talk about psychological disorder, we're talking about things like syndromes, which are gonna be marked by a clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior. So let's break this down into different subcomponents. Let's go everything to after uh, disturbance here. Psychological disorders or syndromes marked by a clinically significant disturbance. All right, so what that's saying is whatever we're talking about, this disorder results in a disruption of your day-to-day -day life or the day-to-day -day life of your average person in a clinically significant way. We'll get into what clinically significant means uh, when we get into the actual uh, diagnostic manual for psychological disorders, but it's gonna be this significant disruption, disturbance in your functioning. It can be in either your cognition, so your thoughts, so, Think, for example, anxiety, right? In your thoughts about the future, in your thoughts about pe other people around you. Your emotion regulation. So you can have psychological disorders like antisocial disorder. And so, um, or actually let's talk about maybe bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder would be a better example, wherein you have really low lows, really depressive symptoms and really high highs, or the state of mania that we um, talk about in bipolar disorder, or in one's behavior. And so you can actually have behavioral disorders wherein it may not be a, an influence on cognition or emotion regulation, but on behavior instead. And that would be things like Tourette syndrome, right? And so, you know, we think, um, kind of the stereotype of Tourette's has always been portrayed in the media as somebody who, you know, utters profane words all the time, but Tourette's is a lot more complex than that. Um, a lot of Tourette's manifest in certain like facial tics or auditory tics. Um, there is a, um, a YouTube channel, I think called SBSK, uh, special books for special kids or by special kids, I think is what it is. Um, and he interviews kids with a lot of different uh, disorders, sometimes physical disorders, um, sometimes psychological disorders. Um, and you can find examples of Tourette's on there where people will have kind of either these vocal tics, um, so like a whistling or a clicking sound or like a facial tic. They'll kind of, it almost looks like they're twitching at times. And so this would be a behavioral example of a psychological disorder. But again, the key word is the significant disturbance, right? Everybody's gonna have a little bit of anxiety at times. Everybody's gonna be a little depressed at times. And so for it to be classified as a disorder, it has to represent a significant disturbance. And to determine what uh, is a significant disturbance, we have to create some sort of baseline some sort of establishment of normalcy, right? So if we're going to define what abnormal is, we need to define 
what normal is. Sometimes you'll hear um, classes, clinical classes taught on psychological disorders um, referred to as abnormal psychology, right? It's a deviation from normal. And so here we're gonna have to define normal. So who's got an idea of how we could actually define what normal is? Somebody give me an answer in the group chat. Well, maybe calling somebody. Tell you what, Bruti, you were the last person to comment. How would you define normal? How would you establish what normal is? Okay, so you say normal is where you perform functions as everyone. Okay, so we're establishing what is sort of the, um, the average functioning of a majority of people. And so in this case, we are establishing uh, normal as essentially what everybody does. But one thing to think about um, for everyone in here is does abnormal, by that definition, ever become normal, right? If enough people have this abnormality or this psychological disorder, can that become the new normal, the new baseline? Um, does or at when average age of person performs? Yeah. And so you have to think about, okay, are psychological disorders relative in this case? I mean, are we comparing this to everybody else? Or are they going to be absolute in the sense that whether or not everybody has a psychological disorder, we would call this still a psychological disorder because it deviates from optimal, right? And so we can establish normal as optimal functioning, or we could define um, normal as kind of the quintessential average. Uh, performance of other people. And why that's important is you'll see these kind of relative changes in behavior in different contexts be deemed differently. So let me give you two examples. First example, Dan works at a bank and every morning as he's getting ready, he has to do everything the exact same way or he's worried he'll make a mistake that will cost the bank big time and get him fired. This involves putting on the left sock first, pants before a shirt, and keeping his shoes off until he's about to walk out the door. Most of us would say that this is a fairly abnormal set of behavior, right? He has allowed his anxiety about um, costing his bank big time to dictate how he goes about his day to day, right? We would say that this is not normal or appropriate behavior. Let's think about this example. In this other case, Dan is a professional baseball player and every morning as he's getting ready, he has to do everything the exact same way or he's worried he will make a mistake that will cost his team the game and get him benched. This involves putting on the left sock first, pants before shirt, keeping his shoes off until he's about to walk out the door. Right? This is almost identical to the one before, but in the context of sports, people tend to forgive this sort of behavior because they think this sort of superstition in the context of sports is appropriate, right? We in the US have a very strong tie 
to superstition when it comes to sports. We tend to think that these sort of ritualistic behaviors um, in an athletic domain are not only appropriate, but some people uh, actively advocate for these types of ritualistic behaviors for the fear of, uh, you know, costing their city the chance to win a championship. It's why you get teams that will do things like playoff beards, uh, where they won't shave until they lose the game, right? They think it's this kind of superstition, and the city will actually cheer on this sort of ritualistic behavior, rather than acknowledging, as in this first example, that it may be kind of deleterious, may be bad for the mental health of the individual. And now think about how these sorts of behaviors would start to develop, right? When we talk about things like conditioning, performing some sort of action and getting a reward reinforces that action, right? In class, we did the example where you had to train your classmate how to do a certain trick that you weren't telling them about, and you went through that conditioning process. The same thing happens with the development of these superstitions or these kind of compulsions or these obsessions, uh, such that you know you wear a certain pair of socks and then you uh, you know hit two home runs and get on base every at bat. Well, you've just reinforced behavior of okay, it must have been those socks because now next time you take off those socks and don't play the game in those socks, you don't play as well. You put them back on, you play as well. Take them off, you don't. Etc. And so you're reinforcing this sort of behavior. And I think the best way for me to illustrate this is uh, in line of what I've already talked about in class, right? So I've told y'all that I have obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, when it's under control, it's normal, right? Everybody thinks, did I forget to turn off the oven? Did I forget to lock the door? Everybody has those thoughts. Those are normal thoughts. When it's not under control, one of the things that kind of differentiates uh, OCD from normal functioning is that it goes way over the top and gets kind of insane, right? And so, you know, when I didn't have my OCD under control, I would have this thought process where I forgot to turn off the oven. It wasn't did I forget to turn off the oven? It was, I know I forgot to turn off the oven and my house is going to burn down if I don't go back home and check it right now, right? There were actually cases where I would leave work, I would drive all the way back home to check the oven, which was always turned off, and then have to come back to work, right? And so it becomes this sort of uh, ritualistic conditioning behavior because the one time I drive back home and the oven wasn't turned off, I have reinforced that behavior. But even if the oven was never left on, I'm reinforcing the behavior because I have this arousal, right? When we talk about Hull's drive reduction theory, we talk about this arousal, this state of tension that has to be resolved. And I'm resolving that tension, that anxiety, by going and checking and making sure that the oven was in fact turned off. So that conditions me, that reinforces that behavior. And that's why one of the ways that we get around uh, psychological disorders like OCD is breaking this pattern of checking. It's stopping the individual from performing these actions and just letting that tension resolve over time, right? So we don't wanna resolve it with actions because those actions get reinforced and it creates a stronger kind of snowballing of that anxiety and that OCD. And so when we think about psychological disorders, we can think about it in kind of this whole biopsychosocial model of things. Bio would be that biology. And a component of that biology would be uh, ties into medicine, right? So when we think about the sort of medical model of mental disorder, it suggests that 
uh, diseases, or in this case, psychological disorders, have physical causes. And so these physical causes are the antecedents, or they are the underpinning for these psychological disorders that can be diagnosed and treated, um, and in a lot of cases actually cured, often through treatment in a hospital or medication, et cetera. Right? And so this leads to research about things like genetic causes, biochemical abnormalities. And so biochemical abnormalities would be like when we talked about the functioning of SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for things like anxiety. Um, the suggestion is that there is insufficient amounts of serotonin being absorbed by that postsynaptic neuron. Um, and so you would want to treat that with, for example, an SSRI because of that biochemical abnormality, that biochemical imbalance. Also things about brain structure, right? And so you can have genetic causes that are independent of brain structure, but you can also have structures of the brain that represent actual uh, physical differences and correspond to differences in um, emotion, cognition, et cetera. Remember one of the examples we talked about um, with homosexuality versus heterosexuality uh, is that homosexual individuals tend to have a brain structure that more closely resembles members of the opposite sex than members of um, their own sex does, right? And so you have kind of the prototypical male brain, you have the prototypical female brain, and uh, gay men tend to have a brain that is kind of erring on the side or it, it's developed and it's built in a way that sort of resembles the female brain structure, right? And so we think about these actual um, nature things that aren't nurture that affect people's actual cognition, their emotion, their behavior, etc. And so the biopsychosocial approach suggests that there are not only these biological influences, but we also have psychological influences and social influences. So the biological influences are what I just mentioned in the medical model. They are the things, the nature, um, not the nurture thing, things. Uh, the psychological influences are things like ruminations or indulging thoughts that are maladaptive. So when I say ruminations, I mean things you kind of get stuck on, a thought you can't get off of, and you keep going back to and back to and back to. We call that ruminating. You also have this issue of kind of indulging thoughts that are maladaptive. So one of the greatest phrases uh, I think I've ever heard in this respect is, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from making a nest there. Right? And so we're all going to have these maladaptive thoughts. We're all going to have those type of thoughts that you've had at one point, and you kind of startle yourself, saying, whoa, where did that thought come from? Everybody has those. Those are normal. But when you indulge those thoughts, when you continue to think about those thoughts, when they're maladaptive in some capacity, and you continue to give them space to make that nest in your head, you then start developing these psychological comorbidities associated with those maladaptive thoughts, right? And so in the case of OCD, I can kind of chart out the development of my OCD, wherein I had those normal thoughts of, hmm, I wonder if I left the stove on. I begin ruminating on it. I can't get off of that thought because I keep allowing myself to think about it. And I keep indulging the thoughts that continue to escalate it, right? Okay, now it's not only did I leave the oven on, but it's I left the oven on. And now it's not only the oven's left on, but it's guaranteed to set my house on fire, right? And so you have these maladaptive thoughts based off of this rumination and this continued fixation. One of the ways to break it is with what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I think I've talked about this a little bit in class already but it's the actual prevention of behavioral responses, right? And so part of the therapy I went through with OCD was when I had that thought of, 
oh my God, I've left the, stu- uh, the oven on and it's going to burn down my house. Not going back home to check and make sure I had turned off the oven, right? At first it creates a substantial amount of anxiety, but over time your brain starts learning not to pay attention to those kind of maladaptive or intrusive thoughts, right? Not allowing that bird to make a nest in your head. You also then have these social influences. So some disorders like anorexia, nervosa, or uh, bulimia occur in food abundant Western cultures that tend not to exist in, um, you know, kind of more impoverished countries. There are these social influences of, uh, you know, body type that affect your perception of yourself in relation to everybody else and creates this kind of cyclical um, change in behaviors, right, of not eating or binge eating and then purging, um, as you would see in, for example, bulimia. Um, And whereas you get things like anorexia and bulimia most frequently in women, there are body dysmorphia disorders that occur in men too, right? Uh, You'll see this a lot with guys who um, feel like they have to go to the gym all the time because they're just not big enough, right? They're not muscular enough. Um, you can sometimes see this in the extreme in professional bodybuilders, right? Guys who have taken, you know, an abundance of steroids have gotten bigger than just about anybody in history and they still feel like they're not big enough, right? It's this body dysmorphia, the social influence of they have to feel like They are the biggest, most impressive physical specimen in an environment, right? So you do have these kind of disorders that will also affect men, not just women. I'm going to pause here. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in that chat box. All right, I'm going to go ahead and push on, but if you do have a question or you're in the midst of typing a question, finish it and type it in that chat box and we'll come back to it. Part of the biopsychosocial model is understanding that you can't separate the brain from the body. For the longest time, there's been this kind of debate about is the brain separate from the mind, right, so the consciousness, and separate from the body. Well, emerging, excuse me, emerging research uh, suggests that uh, the body and the brain are intimately connected in the functioning of both. Um, Daniela asks, are we going to discuss the medicine with any of these disorders? I don't remember if I'm including any discussion of medication in the next presentation. Um, We will talk in two lectures, I think, about different uh, medications and drugs in general. Um, I am not a psychiatrist, right? And so those who are able to prescribe medication would be psychiatrists. Um, They have an MD rather than a PhD. And so I don't know all that much about drugs. Um, What I do know is very limited to um, things like SSRIs um, or things um, like L-DOPA when we talked about Parkinson's. Um, And so if that's something you have an interest in, we can absolutely find other resources. Um, But your best bet would be talking to 
you know, anybody that has an MD who actually goes through the prescriptions of these medications, because they'll be able to tell you a lot better. Now, one of the idiosyncrasies about a lot of this uh, psychopharm or psychopharmacology is that we know a lot of these medicines work, but we don't know why they work. Like we know, we know the mechanism by how they work, like an SSRI, but it's not clear why the SSRI works. And so, um, you know, a lot of these medications are tested in trials for other things because we think we have a theory about why they should work for this. Um, but it winds up being the case that they're, you know, really good at treating something else that they weren't intended for. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I had to take uh, my dog to the emergency vet a while ago um, to get her to purge some grapes she had eaten. Uh, interesting fact, grapes are apparently incredibly toxic for dogs, so don't feed your dog grapes. Um, but one of the medications they used was initially developed to be a painkiller. However, they found out that while it was okay at um, you know, helping with pain mitigation, it actually induced vomiting in most of the pets. And so now they use it at low grades to just induce vomiting. Uh, and so this is a lot of kind of that psychopharmacology of we don't know uh, why it works, we just see kind of the end result. And so we continue on with that. That's kind of a tangent, but uh, we won't be discussing medication in all that much depth, um, but I'm happy to try to find other resources for you if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, so back to this. You can't separate the brain and the body, right? Obviously, uh, when we think about the functioning of the body, the brain is central to that, right? The brain is what's telling the body to move. The brain is kind of processing the pain in the body, processing proprioceptive feedback, your sensory system, et cetera. But it's not just a one-way highway. Um, some really interesting research over the last decade has suggested that your gut bacteria or the microbiome in your stomach actually affects rates of anxiety and depression. And so um, if you've ever had a really bad stomach flu or stomach virus, um, that can kill off a lot of the micro uh, bacteria in your gut, in your stomach. And you may have experienced kind of increases in rates of anxiety or depression thereafter. And so they've uh, you know, found if you uh, ingest some of these probiotics, whether they are like probiotic pills, the right type of just supplements rather, um, or eat a lot of fermented foods, so uh, things like sauerkraut uh, or drink things like kombucha that have these probiotics in them, you can actually help reduce instances of anxiety and depression by stabilizing that microbiome. Again, I don't think we have a full understanding of why that's the case. Um, you know, I think one of the leading theories is about two thirds of the serotonin in your body is associated with your digestive system. And so there may be some interaction between the serotonin uh, and the uh, gut bacteria such that uh, when the gut bacteria gets thrown off, so does the serotonin. And we already know that imbalances in serotonin affect levels of anxiety and depression in the brain. And so let's say you have um, some series of um, kind of maladaptive thoughts or maladaptive behaviors or emotion regulation in your life and uh, you go to talk to a therapist. Well, if you go and talk with the therapist, they're going to do a series of kind of interview questions and talking with you in an attempt to actually diagnose what you have, right? Because the course of treatment for disorders is going to vary as a function of what actual disorder you come or you're presenting with. And a lot of these disorders are what we call comorbid, right? And so they exist with one another right? Uh, anxiety and depression have high rates of comorbidity with one another. That is, if you have high anxiety, chances are you're more likely than the average person to also have higher rates of depression. 
And so uh, you will go and you'll be asked all these questions. Um, and frequently, uh, at least in the early uh, days of a therapist's uh, practice, they'll consult with what we call this DSM, right? This Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders um, that has a list of all these psychological disorders that the field has agreed are disorders. And they have different criterion necessary to meet um, for you to be labeled as having that disorder. So let's take a look at what the DSM-5 says for obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is taken right out of the DSM-5. And so um, to be diagnosed as having OCD, you have to have a uh, presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. So obsessions are defined by one and two. So again, both of these have to be met for it to be an obsession. Both of these have to be met for it to be a compulsion. So obsessions um, are recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or impulses that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive and unwanted, and that most individuals caused marked anxiety or distress. And the individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or to neutralize them with some other thought or action, right? And so this is frequently where you get the compulsions. And so the compulsions um, are a separate component. So you don't have to have compulsions to meet this second criteria, but the compulsions are frequently these repetitive behaviors, for example, hand washing, ordering, checking, or mental acts, so things like praying or counting, repeating words silently, that an individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. And so this would be things, you know, you remember that um, old child game, uh, don't step on a crack, you'll break the mother's back, right? You can take this to the extreme, and those rules must be applied rigidly, wherein a person can't step on a crack or can't step on a crack with a right foot. Um, there are examples of um, you know, OCD where people have to enter a room on a certain foot or they have to leave and come back in and try it again, or they have to touch a doorknob a certain number of times uh, before they can leave or it has to feel just right when they do it. Um, and the second, the behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. However, these behaviors and mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive, right? So obviously hand washing, especially in this day and age, um, are adaptive behaviors. But it's not until you, you know, start having to wash your hands you know, 40 times a day um, I assume that's excessive, you know, um, that it becomes unrealistic or it's um, not tied to reality or it becomes clearly excessive. So uh, you have to have either the obsessions or compulsions or both. And then for you to have OCD, you have to have um, B, C, and D. So the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming. For example, they take more than one hour per day or cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of function. Right? So this is saying that it has to take a lot of time out of your day or it prevents you from being able to behave normally in social situations. Right? So you can't go out with friends to eat um, or you, know, you can't continue to interact in normal social ways can't perform your job normally or other important areas of functioning. So this is kind of open-ended to catch all of other things, but these are serving to represent. Um, the obsessive compulsive symptoms are not attributable to psychological effects of a substance, for example, a drug, of abuse, a medication, or a, another medical condition, right? So this is saying that it doesn't count as OCD if you take a drug and that drug is making you act this way, right? So the first thing you would wanna do is get you off of these drugs that you are abusing. And then, whoopsies. And then the disturbance is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder, right? And so this is saying that perhaps your obsessions are just generalized anxiety disorder, 
And it's not actually an obsession. It's just kind of this fixation, this anxiety. And so you can see how all of these kind of piece together for an actual diagnosis. And these exist for all different psychological disorders. And if you wanted to, you could actually pick up a book and look over this. However, you do want to be careful uh, again, when I talk about, you know, the Psych 100 student syndrome where, and we want to go out and diagnose everybody, uh, this does take a lot of clinical experience to start understanding what are, uh, you know, examples of significant distress or impairment, what's normal, what's abnormal. Um, but this does give you an idea of what the actual um, diagnostic criteria would be for a disorder like OCD. You'll frequently see news articles that present scientific questions in a very non-scientific way. So one example you may have seen is things like autism cases are on the rise. Um, it, it, the problem with that question is it's unclear if more people actually have autism or if we are just getting better at diagnosing autism, right? And so it may be that there's no changes in uh, genetics or environmental factors, but that we've gotten better about access to uh, medical care, better about the understanding of autism. There's less stigma associated with it now, so parents are willing to go out and get their kid tested for autism spectrum. You can also think about the fact that autism spectrum does in fact constitute a spectrum all the way from severe autism to very mild cases of Asperger's that may not even be noticeable to most people. Um, you'll also see headlines like this. So if antidepressants don't work well, why are they so popular? And so one of the issues with psychopharmacology is that if you have an improper diagnosis, you wouldn't expect an antidepressant to work well. So one of the issues we have is, if we start diagnosing a whole bunch of people as depressive that aren't really depressive, right? They may just be having an episode in their life, right? Uh, your significant other breaks up with you, well, everybody's gonna feel depressed in that context, but it may not be representative of a chemical imbalance in the brain, but if we put you in a clinical trial to test antidepressants, you wouldn't expect the antidepressants to work for that person because they're not suffering from the underlying case or the cause of the depression that these antidepressants are designed to treat, right? And so, you know, my main goal with kind of telling you all about this is to make you good consumers of um, news, especially as it pertains to science, right? Correlation does not equal causation, but you also need to think about, okay, what are some of the other potential explanations for this, right? So for those with depression, for whom we believe that there is an underlying um, biochemical imbalance, antidepressants work very well. Uh, another thing you'll see is, you know, antidepressants increase the rates of suicide um, or su uh, excuse me, suicidal ideation. But in reality, it's not necessarily the case that the antidepressants are causing these sort of suicidal thoughts. But what they're doing is in the elevation of somebody out of an incredibly deep depression, what you've done is increased somebody's energy level. And unfortunately, a lot of people that do have deep depression also have kind of suicidal ideation, or thoughts about suicide. And once you start elevating somebody out of a really deep depression, they now have more effort and energy that they begin pouring back into these unfortunate you know, suicidal ideations. Good news is with sustained um, medical treatment, those patients are able to get past that. But it becomes a lot more of a quote unquote sexy headline to say, you know, these drugs cause people to think about suicide. Well, it's a side effect, but it's not a side effect necessarily of the medication. It's a side effect of the actual disorder that we are trying to treat, right? And so think very critically when you see these sorts of headlines of are there potential other explanations in the world? 
Now, one of the um, really hot button topics in psychopharmacology, but also in um, the diagnosis of disorders pertains to ADHD, right? So there has been a substantial increase in um, the prescription of drugs to school age children for ADHD. And one of the issues is that it's twice as likely to be diagnosed in boys as it is in girls. So 11% of grade school aged kids, um, boys, excuse me, are diagnosed with ADHD. We have reason to believe that that is significantly higher than the actual number of kids with ADHD. And so one of the issues is that the school system is designed in such a way that we're asking really young kids to sit still for a long period of time, right? And we know that little boys tend to be a lot more aggressive than little girls, right? And so when um, young girls are struggling in school, they tend to just kind of get lost in their own thoughts. They tend to get distracted, whereas boys tend to act out, right? And so when we think about the high instances of ADHD in which we are prescribing medications like Ritalin, um, it could be an environmental situation wherein it's just a poor environment, right? If you put a four-year-old in front of the computer and told them to listen to this lecture, they're not going to be able to pay attention, right? We would just expect that. Well, it's not necessarily an indication of attention deficit disorder, um, but it's more an indication of the environment is not designed to help those kids. Now, there are absolutely cases of ADHD. Um, and I've known some people that absolutely suffer from ADHD. But the difference here is that ADHD is pretty much a generalized inability to pay attention. ADHD is not an inability to pay attention to things you don't care about, right? We all struggle to pay attention to things we don't care about, right? In fact, I suspect a substantial percentage of y'all are struggling to pay attention during my lectures, but that's not indicative of ADHD, right? Because you'll be able to go home and focus on reading that book that you really enjoy or playing those video games that you really enjoy. And so thinking about what are the environmental things that cause us to believe somebody may have a disorder that may not actually have a disorder. All right, so I'm gonna pause for a second. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in that chat box. I'm gonna run and go blow my nose real quick and I'll be back and we'll continue on. All right, I am not seeing any questions, so we're going to go ahead and push on. But if you do have questions, like always, go ahead and type them in that group chat box. So uh, I want to show a couple examples of specific disorders. Um, in this case, it'll be a movie. In other cases, um, it'll be a clip, and you get to see these. But if you haven't seen the movie Rain Man, uh, you should watch it. It's a really good depiction of a real life person named Kim Peek. Uh, in this case, they changed his name for the movie. But Kim Peek, who is what we call an autistic savant, right? So uh, he has autism. Right? And so one of the um, principal components of autism is substantial interference with normal social functioning. And so you'll see an example of that. Uh, but one of the things that differentiates uh, Kim Peek, or in this case, um, you know, Dustin Hoffman's character, is that he also has what we call savantism. And so savantism is frequently limited to one specific category, but Kim Peek is one of these really exceptional individuals wherein his savantism kind of spans the spectrum. And so he has this incredible, almost photographic memory. And so um, to give you an example, uh, his brother talks about you know, a page that may take us three minutes to read uh, in a book. 
and we may retain you know, 20 percent of that information, Kim Peek is able to read that same page in about eight seconds and retain about 98 percent of it. So you're going to see an example here of um, you know, a Hollywood depiction of a real man who is an autistic savant. So we'll go ahead and play this here. <laughs> Good morning. Copy. Yes, Sally. Good. Sally Gibbs to Sally. Four six one oh oh one nine two. How did you know my phone number? How did you know that? She read the telephone book last night. Did Sally four six one oh one nine two? He uh, remembers things, little things sometimes. Very clever, boys. I'll be right back. How'd you do that? How'd you do that? Um, you memorize the whole book? No. You start from the beginning? Yeah. How far did you get? G. G? G. God sake, William Marshall. God sake. You memorized G. Yeah, G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G. Half a G. Right? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. We hungry? Yeah, Tuesday we have pancakes. Pancakes? Right? Yeah, sounds good. We have some pancakes. maple syrup. Yeah, you bet your butt, bet your butt. Uh oh, we have pancakes. Uh -oh. Of course, I, what is this, Ray? Of course, I don't have my toothpicks. No, you don't need toothpicks. I was okay in the hotel last night with the pizza, but in a restaurant, you need a fork. Of course, I don't have my toothpicks. You don't need toothpicks, Ray. Right? Pancakes keep selling you off. I don't have my maple syrup either. I'm gonna be without my maple syrup and my, and my toothpaste. I don't see any pancakes to your right? Yeah. Of course, yeah, Thomas maple syrup is not here. Okay. When we order the pancakes, they're gonna bring the maple syrup. The maple syrup is supposed to be on the table before the pancakes. We haven't ordered yet, right? And of course, when they bring the maple syrup after the pancakes, it'll definitely be too late. How is that gonna be too late? Huh? Right? We haven't ordered the pancakes yet. How is that going to be? We're going to be here the entire morning with no with no maple syrup and and and, and no and no toothpicks. I'm definitely definitely not going to not going to have my my, my pancakes. But with, 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 ow! Don't make this. Ow! Fucking retard. Uh oh. What you see here is a really good representation, not only of kind of that savantism, but of severe autism. Right. So in this case, uh, severe autism is manifesting, uh, in this example, of uh, being really rigidly tied to structure. One of the things that substantially interferes with somebody's functioning who has autism is um, disruption in the schedule, things that weren't planned, right? Uh, he says, you know, on Tuesday we eat pancakes, uh, he needs the toothpicks. The maple syrup has to be out before the pancakes. And if not, this really throws him into a tizzy. And so sometimes um, this will involve kind of emotional, even physical backlash um, in really extreme examples. Now, this is a very far extreme of autism, and you can have way more milder all the way to kind of the Asperger's um, side of the spectrum that is represented by just kind of uh, social disruption. And so, uh, Bruti asks, is autism curable? I mean, if a child has autism, and if that kid gets proper treatment, does it cure and can be like a normal kid? Um, so autism itself is not curable, but there are treatments and therapies for autism. So uh, at the real extreme cases of autism, um, somebody like a speech pathologist may be required to come in and help that um, kid develop normal speech patterns, right? Develop, and even if not normal, some form of speech that allows that kid to communicate their wants and their desires. Um, at the lesser end, you may have kind of almost this social training, right? Learning how to interpret social situations, understand um, facial feedback and body feedback. And so, uh, whereas there's no treatment or cure, there are ways in which you can kind of help enhance an individual's functioning in their environment. Um, but at the very extreme examples, that usually takes a substantial amount of resources and time. That's a very good question.
Oopsies. So next, I want to show you an example of a panic attack. And we're not going to show you, um, I mean, this is a whole special where he talks about uh, the development of his panic. Uh, and you can actually go back and watch it. But I want to show you just what it looks like while somebody is having a panic attack. And next tonight, something different. Imagine millions of people. There are things holding us back from being happy, and we're not aware of it until life hits us over the head with a frying pan. And that is what happened to me. From ABC News, this is Good Morning America. Welcome to the most embarrassing day of my life. We're going to go now to uh, Dan Harris, who's at the news desk. Eh? Good morning, Charlie and Diane. Thank you. This is me 10 years ago. And the reason this is the most embarrassing day of my life is not that it looks like I've been attacked by a blow dryer and a can of hairspray. No, it's that I am about to freak out on national television. Health News Now, one of the world's most commonly prescribed medications may be providing a big bonus. Researchers report people who take cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins for at least five years may also lower their risk for cancer. But it's too early to, to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. At this point, I realize I'm helpless, so I bail right in the middle. Uh, that does it for news. We're going to go back now to Robin and Charlie. All right, thanks very much, Dan Harris at the news desk with some of the headlines of the morning. Want to go to Tony Perkins now. And so you see an example there of a really um, a representative example of a panic attack. You can see his breath starting to get shorter, right? It's almost like he's getting out of breath. You can start seeing kind of these a little bit of panic um, mannerisms. You can see the actual development until he kind of almost shuts down, right? It's, he's become so overwhelmed at the end of that sentence that he then has to throw it back to the other anchors without continuing on his actual presentation. So what's happening in panic attacks is kind of this overwhelming fear of, uh, I'm trying to think of a word other than panic, but this really overwhelming fear of panic. Right, and so you get these physiological reactions. It's kind of like this fight or flight. You have the attention tunneling, so now you're not able to focus on other things. Um, and it's an unbelievable physical envelopment. So if you've ever had a moment of panic in your life, that's what a panic attack is like. It will uh, oftentimes be caused by nothing at all. It's just something that uh, can arise. And a lot of people will have had a panic attack at some point in their life. I know I've had a panic attack and it's a really uncomfortable thing, but you can see how it's a almost entirely psychological phenomenon, right? He shuts down completely and is in his own head about this sort of panic. The good news is it passes and there are ways uh, with which psychologists can help people who suffer from panic attacks to deal with it, even without the psychopharm aspect, but there are psychopharm um, ways to help kind of treat that. But that would be a really classic example of a panic attack. And next. And then finally, I'm going to show you an example of schizophrenia, right? We tend to have very distorted views about what schizophrenia is like based off of movies, or they tend not to show the actual distortions of reality for somebody with schizophrenia. They just kind of show that person acting irrational. Um, and I want to show this example because this does a really good job of highlighting real world distortions that people have reported um, for schizophrenia. And you can start to see how there's this dissociation between reality and um, fiction that's being created in somebody's mind. And again, that YouTube channel I was telling you about, the SBSK, uh, does an interview with uh, one young man um, who does have schizophrenia and talks about, you know, the struggles associated with that of trying to help himself figure out, okay, what's real, what's not real. And you'll see a really good depiction here of just how real and compelling some of these distortions will be. Um, I, I will warn you, this is kind of very um, unsettling. You know, there's nothing that um, will in theory, change you forever, but it is a very kind of um, eye-opening uh, example that you can look into and see what actual 
schizophrenia may look like. So I'm going to go ahead and play this here and we'll talk about it after. It's a longer video. Undiagnosed or not being treated effectively enough. The symptoms you will experience represent a compilation of a range of sensory occurrences as reported by actual patients. These occurrences include sights, sounds, as well as wind and even scents. If you have any discomfort during the experience, please signal a facilitator. Worthless. He's waking up now. Oh, the phone woke him up. Don't answer. They'll know who you are. You're a waste of space. Why are you so stupid? A waste of our time. Stupid. So stupid. Worthless. We hate you. He's gonna pick up the phone. They'll know if you lie. It's Something rain. wrong. Mother. <laughs> Poison. He's hanging up. Can you hear me? Don't eat. Out to get you. Poison. They know about you. Poison. The suspects were described as medium in stature with a slightly youthful demeanor. Anyone with information about this incident is urged to contact They know. Them. They know about you. And in other news, officials have closed the northbound... Time for men. Don't do that. Now here's a story out of Chicago from last night. Two men posing as maintenance workers nearly made it out of the quick bike convenience store with the store's ATM machine. Make a list. Make a longer list. Enter the store, the you are ungrateful. Because You're a waste of problems. space. A waste of our time. Going to take the back to Get a coffee now. Don't drink it. Sensing stupid. So stupid. That smells awful. Car. Don't drink that coffee. When the clerk told the men he had called police, the pair took off. Why are you so worthless? So, Sky, tell us how this weekend's weather is. Weather. Something wrong. You know what, Chuck? There's just no stop in the weekend weather. <laughs> you hear that, worthless? Weather's coming to get Something you. Something wrong. Weather. And hey, what are you going to do about it, huh? Something wrong. You have to stop it. You're just going to sit around, your stupid mouth open, and do nothing? You oh. have to stop it. It's the weather. It's here for us. Now he has to answer the door. It's here for us. Do something. Stay in. Pizza. Stay away from the no. door. Stop the weather. Protect us. Pizza. You didn't order anything. No, 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 no. Don't answer. You're stupid to open that door. He has to open the door now. Here you go. Don't do it. Don't be in trouble. Poison. This is for you. This is for you. He's working with them. He's part of the plot. This is for you. Shut the door. Shut it. Don't eat it. Boys, you're stupid to open. I hate you. We hate Here's some you. items on today's activities calendar. And you need some activities, especially when you're lazy and you sleep too much. Stop staring at me. I know what you're thinking. He knows. You can't stop. They're it. coming for you. You know that. Part of the plot. It's your mind. It's because you're so ungrateful. Don't eat it. Poison. No, no, no. Don't open it. He has to open the box. This is entirely your fault. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Poison. Poison. They're here. And it's all your fault. Oh. No, no, no. We know it's you. You're in Don't control. open the door. You hear that? No, no, no. Don't open it. Don't open it. They're here. And it's all your fault. You did it. You should have used your mind to stop it. Stop it. You have to take control. Stop the door. Ray. 
You're right in here? I called you, why didn't you answer? I was like screaming, it's the rain, it's the rain! Into the phone at the top of my lungs. What were you watching? Do you even remember? Did the uh, pizza I, oh, what happened here? Forget to take your medicine this morning. Now, you know it's not good to miss a dose. Well, it's not too late to take it now. Let's get back on track. And why are you standing here in the dark? It's a beautiful day outside. Let some sunlight in. You need to get outside and enjoy it. Yeah, so what you see there is a really great representation of actual kind of schizophrenic breaks. Um, you saw everything from voices in his head to, um, you know, his perception that the news anchors and the weathermen were actually talking to him. You also saw distortions of um, his perceptions of weather, right? And so, as you saw at the beginning and at the end, there were no storms outside, but he continued to hear these storms and he heard the weathermen talking about storms outside and rain and weather. And you start seeing this kind of disjointed reality wherein even the um, woman who is living with him or who came there to visit him uh, says, as she turns her back, something that seems kind of almost very accusatory. Do you even remember? And so you get this really substantial um, uh, kind of break between reality and uh, these hallucinations, even like the pizza was bubbling and the coffee was bubbling, things like that. And you hear these really negative kind of um, voices that he was experiencing. And so one of the really difficult parts of, uh, or of uh, excuse me, schizophrenia is the fact that as somebody kind of develops into schizophrenia, they start becoming aware that they can't dissociate reality from fiction, right? And so they will have to have certain routines in their life where they can kind of ground to know that a hallucination isn't real, right? They don't want to go out to completely novel situations, go out where they don't know anybody, because now they can't tell if the person they're interacting with is a real person or if it's somebody that their brain has just created, right? And so you'll sometimes see Unfortunately, it's very common um, to see kind of schizophrenic breaks in some of the homeless population. And so you'll see cases wherein um, a homeless man or woman seems to be talking to people around them, but there's nobody around them, right? And this is in the midst of this really substantial schizophrenic break, wherein their perception is they're surrounded and they're talking to other people. There's just nobody there, right? It's as real to them as it is real to you and I when we're talking to other people. And it becomes really debilitating. Um, and there are medications that can help reduce these kind of schizophrenic uh, breaks and schizophrenic dissociations and help with some of that paranoia that's also very frequently comorbid with schizophrenia. But you do see a really good representation in here of just how terrifying it can be and how real it can seem. So next time we're gonna talk about psychological disorders again. We're gonna talk more about uh, classic examples, concrete examples, and kind of the different groups and classifications of disorders. I'm gonna hang out here. If y'all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll hang out until the last person logs off. Uh, but otherwise, I will quote unquote, see you on Thursday. Adios. What's the difference between panic attacks and anxiety attacks? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, I don't know this for sure, so I would not take this to the bank, but my understanding is panic attacks tend to be very physical in nature. That's where you're getting this kind of overwhelming fight or flight, this adrenaline response, you feel hot, you feel your heart race, et cetera. Anxiety attacks, um, I believe, tend to be more cognitively focused, right? This 
uh, overwhelming fixation on something. It's not necessarily that you're having a, an additional physical component of it. It's just this all encompassing mental um, fixation on something. Really quickly, can you re-explain the savant thing? I didn't really understand what that was. Yeah, so savantism is uh, these kind of superhuman capabilities. So in Kim Peek's example, it's a superhuman memory. Uh, there are also musical savants out there. And so they can listen to a piece of music once and immediately recreate it. And so savantism is just this kind of superhuman capability to do something. Yeah, so the question of how do you get autism, um, that's not fully known. Um, there is likely a substantial genetic component, um, but there's also potentially environmental um, causes. Um, you know, one of the environmental causes that um, you'll hear about all the time is vaccines cause autism. And there's no, absolutely no evidence that they cause autism. And in fact, if anything, there's substantial evidence that they don't cause autism. Um, there could be uh, perhaps diet things that affect the manifestation or the likelihood that somebody gets autism. Um, and so you'll see little bits of evidence here and there of small contributions to autism, but there's not one thing that we know causes autism. Um, and so, uh, you'll frequently see that, oh, they got it at 18 months, but that's frequently just when uh, it starts becoming obvious, right? Before 18 months, there's not much social interaction, right? So it's hard to know that a kid has autism until you should be having this actual development. And so um, your uh, cousin has likely had autism uh, his whole life, but it didn't manifest until became about 18 months old when it became obvious that something was developmentally not on track. Could you explain more about the difference between OCD and uh, generalized anxiety disorder and how they may overlap or get misdiagnosed? Um, I'll be honest, I don't know all that much about generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I think the principal difference is that OCD tends to have some sort of compulsion aspect to it, right? You feel like you have to wash your hands, you feel like you have to check the door handle, you feel like you have to land on your foot a certain way. Um, generalized anxiety, I think, is more just kind of um, an example of uh, anxiety across the board on various things. So there isn't kind of this compulsive aspect of it. Um, but uh, we can absolutely uh, open up the, um, the DSM to look at what constitutes generalized anxiety disorder. I mean, there's anxiety inherent in both of those, and there's anxiety in a lot of other um, uh, disorders as well. And so I don't know what the specific differentiation is, uh, but we can definitely find that out for you. Uh, yes, this will be on the final. Yes, the final is cumulative. Um, no important announcements and everything else has been recorded, so I'll post that on YouTube. Uh, yes, you can, Ashton, although I don't know if I changed the settings. So let me just unmute you real quick. All right, you should be able to talk, Ashton. Um, so when you were using the example for kids that say, like, needed to watch, listen to this lecture and they wouldn't be a be able to pay attention for like ADHD uh -huh. would, would like the test like TOVA that the test for ADHD that's that long boring test where like a kid will watch the computer and look for a box a little box inside of it 
and they have to press a button when it's a certain one, would that be unreliable because that's a boring test? Anybody would not be able to pay attention to that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I don't know that test in particular, and I think you're on something that um, because it's so inherently boring, you are um, just less likely to pay attention. But uh, I suspect that's deliberate because they want to find points at which attention breaks. And now what they're probably going to do with a test like that is baseline your average child and see how long they're able to pay attention or how well they're able to perform at a task and then compare the child that's being tested against that baseline. And so that is kind of that relativistic um, definition of normal that we had talked about um, at the beginning of class. And so uh, I don't know that task. Um, if I were designing a task from the beginning, um, I, you know, I would probably want it to be to some degree engaging. Um, but I, I think what you are primarily looking for are discrepancies on the same boring task between the normal child and the child with ADHD. Okay. Good Thank question. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.